uh, the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Shahzad Khan uh, talk about the public health implications of uh, COVID-19. Uh, you, uh, most or all of the attendings today are probably familiar with our uh, format. Uh, it's going to be a one hour long uh, webinar. Uh, the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes will be spent uh, through a uh, you know, formal talk by Dr. Shahzad Khan, uh, after which um, we will have a panel discussion uh, discussing a lot of the questions that have already been posed uh, through the WhatsApp group. Uh, and then also additional questions that uh, attendees from today are welcome to add uh, into the Q and A uh, section of your uh, Zoom window. So, without further ado, Dr. Sadat Khan, please uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Walid. Uh, there was a there was a chat about the volume. I hope it's better now. Uh, Walid, can you verify? Is it okay? Yes, please continue. It's okay. 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 Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, good evening from Islamabad. I think it's good morning in U.S. and many of the uh, other, other uh, outside outside the uh, outside Pakistan. Um, initially, I'll I'll give you a little bit of background about what is happening in Pakistan. You know, uh, the numbers are all over. Uh, we have around 140,000 uh, sort of cases already um, uh, sort of identified. Uh, many would be uh, without any uh, tests, so there will be much more than this number actually. More than 2,500, 2,600 deaths uh, have been have been uh, sort of registered. Uh, the same applies to them because of the fact that the testing was initially low, so we couldn't test much of the people uh, initially who were getting the disease, and especially when they had uh, comorbidities. So, in in cases of comorbidities, mostly uh, people died uh, because of the add-on complications, uh, maybe of uh, corona. Uh, but actually the label oh, given to them was uh, this, um, whatever their primary cause was. Um, so far, uh, the, uh, we can say that there is uh, now, uh, I, can, I, can, uh, I can see there is now a clear recognition of uh, the issue with the government as well as with the people. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the people, uh, population and common men and women, they were talking about a lot of uh, stuff regarding the conspiracy theories and a, a lot of um, um, saying that it's, it's not that serious. Uh, there were many people who were uh, not accepting the fact that it will be a, uh, it will be a very, uh, very uh, serious problem. Uh, this is something which uh, uh, was triggered by some of the comments from uh, different uh, high-level officials, including politicians and others, and a lot of international messages coming through WhatsApp and social media, other social media. Uh, but now, uh, as far as we can see in Rawalpindi Islamabad region, every other household has got at least one or two cases of COVID. So all of my family members, accomplices, friends, colleagues, all of them almost know somebody who has got a, a, a COVID patient. This was not the case, say, two, two weeks ago, or at least not a month ago. So uh, the thing, thing is that it, is, it has spread at a very fast uh, pace for Pakistan. The initial 50,000 cases took around three months, 87, 86, 87 days. So we reached from zero to 50,000 in maybe three months, but we reached from 50,000 to 100,000 in seven days. So that that was too too fast a speed for for any uh, for any uh, spread of uh, infection. Uh, something like uh, you can see that uh, uh, the uh, same same uh, sing signal was given by a lot of private sector hospitals when they um, erected the board saying we are full we are not accepting any patient of corona. So there were some in Karachi, some in Lahore, and then in Islamabad some of the some of the pictures roaming around. So people came to know that there are now no hospital beds. Uh, there is a big issue in Pakistan of availability of beds. And then I started having calls from what different colleagues of uh, reference in different big hospitals in Pakistan because of my student base, because of my, say, 27, 28 years service in, in this area. 
they thought maybe I could help get them a, a bed. Then I realized that this is a problem in which uh, people have now started suffering more. It's not just the fear of disease, it's the, it's the treatment uh, shortcomings as well as a lot of issues uh, which, which revolve around this, uh, uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, to brief you about a little bit, because the topic of today is living with COVID. So why I chose this topic? Uh, because I have seen some of my colleagues, I have seen, and I'm talking to you from a COVID house. I mean, I'm you know, upstairs in a, in a separate room, but uh, my wife, Dr. Dabinda, she got, positive, got uh, symptoms on 28th of May. I also had a little bit of symptoms, fever and slight cough. We both got tested on 29th May and uh, her result was COVID positive. Mine was COVID negative. Maybe it was a false negative because the similar symptoms were almost the same. So she was isolated. She came upstairs and she had high grade fever, severe myalgia, body aches, um, uh, cough with sputum. So all typical symptoms of COVID, which, which are textbook symptoms uh, since the day one when the COVID was uh, diagnosed, they were, they were supposed to be a high grade fever with body aches, myalgia and severe cough uh, with breathlessness. So uh, she was isolated and we immediately started Panadol and one antibiotic, azithromycin and anti-allergic, vitamin D, vitamin C, whatever the most of the consultants, you know, uh, most of the consultants were recommending these kind of uh, medications. And we were lucky that she got uh, her symptoms approved within two days. So I am I am actually telling you my, my own um, sort of uh, uh, his, sort of information with living with a COVID case and also my myself uh, because I was also diagnosed uh, having COVID positive on 9th of June although I had very little little, little symptom and my symptoms were also relieved like Dr. Tabinda's symptoms so um, this was something which. Uh, which which we had both uh, contracted and we uh, she actually got tested negative after 14 days the, the, her two two tests became negative uh, mine is awaited hopefully inshallah i'll also be tested negative but symptoms are much less than uh, they were initially so uh, from from the covid uh, house and from people who 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 are who are in contact with me about this disease uh, there are some some observations from Pakistan, and then we can discuss. It's, it's, it will not be a one-sided uh, thing. All of you can contribute or uh, comment because we have one hour. Let's say uh, 30 minutes. I'll, I'll take 30 minutes, and then uh, we will give time to all of our panelists and all of our colleagues who are online. Um, uh, the the thing is that uh, there is something which is very common nowadays is uh, a lot of people with minimal symptoms. So in my family, in my colleagues, in my friends, there is one extreme of cases. There is one extreme of cases who have um, almost, almost uh, very little symptom, like even, even no fever, uh, just a little bit of uh, sore throat, just a little bit of body aches, and that's it. Uh, the um, other extreme is that people, they get diagnosed. And within two days, they end up with a severe breathlessness, chest uh, discomfort, and they end up in a hospital and they are put on ventilators. So I have no idea of how, how this disease uh, progresses in different, uh, different uh, uh, sort of uh, individuals. It, within the same family, we have people with very less symptoms, very uh, sort of uh, inconspicuous uh, symptoms. And others having very severe symptoms of respiratory distress syndrome and there is another thing which 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 we have we have seen for the last one month which is a very common symptom which was with me as well as well as Tabinda uh, it was severe diarrhea so the severe gastroenteritis is one additional which was already mentioned that it can cause diarrhea but nowadays in Pakistani cases we have we are witnessing a lot of Gastro, gastric problems in the cases of Corona. I had it and I had to use a lot of um, medication for uh, sort of herbal or you can say subgol and yogurt and desi jo totke hote hain. Wo sare try ki and I got better. Uh, my diarrhea didn't complicate much and it, it made me weak but and, and, and it was uh, it was I think that that was the worst symptom which I had for my, my Corona. Uh, Tabinda had uh, cough and high grade fever and myalgia. Other my family members, some of them, they had got COVID 
and they they have uh, body aches and fever and cough so uh, one thing which is very common in this country is the presentation complaint is very diverse people have different complaints there is no typical uh, case uh, only a few have a typical symptoms of corona and uh, they end up going for testing and they get positive on the other side there are some very very typical cases of covid with fever with cough uh, is a uh, big patches on the lungs on x rays and tested negative consecutively so i have seen some of my friends who were tested more than three or four times repeatedly for within the period of one week and they didn't get a positive pcr test for corona but their half of the lung on one side was collapsed and there were patches on the other side on the both second on the other on the other lung uh, they had fever they had cough and they have or they had all the symptoms of so that also complicates uh, a, a problem of corona because um, in many of the peripheral areas of pakistan you will not get an x ray done you will not get a good uh, gp who will auscultate and get your pneumonia diagnosed from your chest uh, and you will be given a small sort of a medication and the lung may uh, become more uh, sort of more uh, damaged in, in in the time being uh, something which is uh, which is also strange is that there are a lot of asymptomatic cases uh, you know i i have been in touch with nih and i haven't been in touch with a lot of people who are doing zero prevalence uh, studies um uh, people have told me that there are a lot of cases in pakistan who are asymptomatic um and they were just accidentally uh, they were supposed to be um uh, going for with somebody else and they got them tested themselves and the corona was positive uh so so there were extreme of situations over here on one side you have asymptomatic cases with the tested positive on the other side you have very Uh, febrile um, uh, pneumonic patches and very high grade fever and cough cases with pcr negative and in between there is there is a mix of symptoms which um, which are um, happening uh, around the country um, like like i mentioned the acceptance is is here now so people do accept that this is a disease and the fear of disease is actually more than the disease itself so we are more afraid of getting the disease um uh, and and this has created a lot of anxiety so what i see is another big wave of anxiety and mental health issues i saw uh, it was good to see uh, professor rizwan taj uh, with us in this uh, webinar um there are a lot of lot of mental health issue issues which are emerging i we already have a very high burden of common mental disorders in pakistan a uh, very high burden of anxiety depression and mental retardation in in the children uh, and in adults there, there is depression and anxiety this disease has i think at at, at least it has doubled uh, the the common mental issues of of pakistanis um access to care you can see uh, uh, my it's my personal opinion i i will not uh, i i cannot uh, sort of verify this by numbers but my my personal opinion as uh, this based on a lot of people who came came across with the health system so the more interaction you have with the healthcare delivery system with the tertiary care hospital there are chances that you will get a more complicated disease i don't know how how we can prove this but for the last 3 months i have been following people those who stayed at home those who took good remedy good take good good diet nutrition panadol antibiotics on tele consultation uh, they discussed uh, uh, something like by you can say uh, by by telephone or by just staying positive and and keeping positive and staying at home they were better off than those who were taken or they went to the hospital on foot they walked to the hospital they insisted on being being admitted over there say few two weeks ago three weeks ago when there were beds available uh they kept on moving back to hospitals again and again they got more complications so uh, more interaction you have with a high risk facility like a tertiary care um the chances of your disease getting uh, getting worse disease uh, i think uh, this is something which i am building on um definitely it has to be substantiated by some data uh, it is just an anecdotal evidence this is just an uh, evidence of uh, my um colleagues and my other uh, friends and uh, family members telling me about uh, the different cases so uh, the issue is that there are 
uh, huge number of cases in Pakistan, and I will definitely multiply them by at least 10 to make a number of uh, total cases in Pakistan because of the fact that we have tested very less. So if there are 100,000, 150,000, so maybe 1.5 million cases would be there in Pakistan. Uh, there was a study in Punjab where, where they attributed around 600,000 cases in, in Lahore only. Uh, that was based on some estimation uh, on, on based on sampling. Uh, majority of the cases, around 85 to 86% are asymptomatic uh, or minimal symptoms around 10% from 85 to 95%, about 10% they have moderate symptoms like high grade fever, severe body aches, cough, uh, chest infections, and around 5% have very, very serious complications like unconsciousness and uh, severe diarrhea and dehydration and, uh, and uh, respiratory distress syndrome. So this is something which is uh, going on over here. Um, we have increased testing, it's around 30,000 tests per day. Uh, 30,000 tests per day is still very less than the required number, which was around one month ago. We were supposed to be doing 50,000 tests per day, but we are still half the way um, uh, after one month. Um, the number of testing should be at least maybe 80 or 90,000 by now. Uh, the uh, the uh, openness of uh, different uh, shopping areas and other uh, free movement of people, it is also there. Uh, there, are, there is almost unrestricted movement to anywhere, um, and uh, that also is making a, a big problem of uh, uh, carrying the virus to different uh, one place to other uh, places. And similarly, there are some issues with the uh, availability of uh, uh, availability of space inside the hospital. That is another issue. And then there is another pri unchecked, unregulated private sector profiteering and hoarding uh, that has also emerged as a big public health issue in this country. Uh, people charging uh, up to in millions uh, from the cases. Um, uh, you can compare the, the, the Pakistani rupee into dollar rate. So they are charging almost uh, uh, hospital beds or per day room charges into do US dollars and thousands of dollars per day. Uh, that is another uh, thing which was coming up uh, in different uh, sort of uh, news. Um, my suggestion and, and my own experience, which I had been through, my like I told you, uh, my wife, she got it and then she got recovered and now she's back uh, to normal routine. Uh, I myself got it and then I uh, felt much better and I'm still feel, feeling much better. I hope uh, that it will resolve um, uh, without much complications. Uh, two of my kids, they have uh, the disease, maybe because it was in the family, so they also got it. They also are le least symptomatic. Uh, hopefully, uh, they will also uh, go through uh, this, this phase of uh, whatever this 10 days or 12 days period is. Um, most of the time, uh, I have seen is that being optimistic, being uh, good in, in your nutrition, being good in your thoughts, in your ideas, uh, thinking positively, don't uh, no, no, not thinking about only the downsides and the negative things. Uh, don't talk. Uh, don't uh, sort of uh, waste yourself in too much of. Uh, unnecessary discussions and online uh, identification of treatments and trying those treatments on yourself. There are some herbal as well as some allopathic treatments, but uh, none of them so far, I don't think any of them has proven to be effective. Uh, there is no treatment at, at present. Uh, I don't think there is any golden uh, drug or any, any gold standard treatment protocol which can affect everybody. Different drugs affect different people. But one thing which I have seen is uh, the early you respond to, the early you recognize the issue, the early you isolate yourself and start taking care of yourself, like uh, good diet, rest, and uh, anti-inflammatories. So uh, in the, as soon as possible, you take uh, anti-allergic and anti-inflammatory drugs. I think the immune response definitely uh, doesn't go to that level. Uh, which may create problems for you. For us, for all of us, like uh, four, four or five cases within my home, um, we did, what we did was we immediately started Panadol, although it, it, the fever was less, but still because of its anti-inflammatory, it's not just for fever. People think that it's only for the fever, but I think it is more than just uh, antipyretic. It is an anti-inflammatory drug, uh, which has worked uh, globally. So we took paracetamol and uh, then added, because of the fever and chest infection, added antibiotic. And uh, although it's a, uh, 
it's a uh, uh, sort of um, antiviral. Uh, it, it's, it's a viral uh, uh, disease, but I have seen antibiotics, antibiotics working in almost all the cases. So um, uh, for my own uh, known family members of 10 plus, all of them, when we started antibiotics, they felt within two days, they felt much better. Myself, my wife, my kids, all, all of them had uh, felt better with Panadol and, and, and a good antibiotic. Azithromycin is one, but there can be many others. Uh, none of them uh, in my family have tried any antiviral or any other uh, different kind of uh, treatments which are being circulated. Uh, this is something which is, uh, which is common for, uh, for us. Uh, the issue is that there are so many, uh, so many uh, other uh, things which are, which are parallel in this country uh, moving around. So we, ha we have a very high burden of, you know, heart disease. It's around 25% adults in Pakistan, they are hypertensive. So one in four uh, is supposed to be having uh, a, 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 a hypertension. Around 12 to 13% have diabetes, around 9%, the recent survey showed hepatitis C. There is a very high prevalence of malnutrition. There is a very high prevalence of uh, anxiety and depression. So coupled with all those cases, this uh, alone, this uh, corona is not that much of a very high prevalence uh, to, to make a huge mortality. But given that we have such a huge comorbidities, the estimates which are coming up for maybe July and August, they are also taking into consideration the comorbidity. So maybe corona alone may not be that much fatal, that much lethal, but in a, in a country where every fourth or third or uh, fifth person is either diabetic or hypertensive or, or mental health and other issues, corona will definitely affect them very badly. Uh, so we have to be uh, very clear about one thing that we should be uh, uh, trying to prevent uh, uh, as much as possible. And if we get it, we should act immediately and as soon as possible. <clears throat> So, uh, Walid, if you um, have any, any, anybody else to talk to, I think I'll stop. And um, um, if, if there are some questions, uh, some comments, uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can discuss those. That's great, uh, Dr. Shahzad Khan. Uh, this is Majid Shafiq. Um, thank you very much for you know, such a wonderful overview. And I think one thing that I really uh, found useful uh, from your discussion, your talk was sort of the the personal uh, and professional references that you made as well, which really sort of drives home the point that, uh, you know, COVID, it's a pandemic. Uh, it is neither absent from Pakistan, nor is it something that is a conspiracy hatched exclusively against uh, Pakistan. This is unfortunately a worldwide tragedy that is unfolding in different countries at their own pace for a variety of reasons, right? Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't um, infect everybody in the same uh, at the same speed. Obviously, in a country like the U.S., uh, that is uh, massively interlinked through interstate highways and very heavy domestic travel, uh, it's conceivable. It's understandable that the pace uh, of uh, you know the the peak uh, was so much quicker. And now in Pakistan, we're seeing uh, you know some of that as well. So. We have an excellent uh, you know, panel here, um, and I have some questions that the audience has asked as well. Some of them have been asked through the Q&A over here, and then we've also had some questions previously um, submitted through uh, the WhatsApp group as well. Okay. Um, I, uh, you know, I think one of, the, one of the general themes that I see here, which is a very, very important theme here, knowing so many personal examples of people who are struggling to find any beds in Pakistan currently, uh, whether they be ventilator beds, ICU beds, or simply regular beds. Uh, you know, I think a major theme that comes up is what to do uh, with, as far as home-based management is concerned. So one of the questions that some people have asked is, uh, you know, what's the best antipyretic uh, should we use something like Panadol or should we use Ibuprofen? And yeah, you know, I think related to that is another question somebody asked, and I'm going to quote, if, some, if someone gets over, uh, over the body aches and still has a temperature of 99 Celsius throughout the day, should, be, should they be advised to continue Panadol, you know, come what may? 
So maybe if Dr. Shahid, you can answer okay. those first, and then I'll have okay. others chime in if they want to. Okay, just uh, my own experience. Uh, I think the need for beds should be linked with the need for oxygen and need for uh, severe respiratory distress. Uh, just lying around on a bed inside a hospital will make things worse, uh, not only for the person himself or herself, but also for the family. So you will be exposing yourself into a much higher viral load as well as many other infectious agents, plus exposing your family. So I don't think, I, I, and I think I, I, I mentioned it in my, in my introduction, that I have seen people who have had a more interaction with the hospital uh, getting serious on a, on a very high rate, high, high speed, as compared to those who didn't go near a hospital and they went for a home, uh, home care. To do home care, um, I think for a, for, a, for, for a high literate or literate, literate family, it is very easy to get hold of a pulse oximeter, a thermometer or thermogun, whatever you may call it. We had, uh, I, I, I purchased a, a gun which, is, which was um, uh, showing the temperature on, on just uh, one click. Um, and it was good because we cross-checked it with the thermometer, the normal traditional thermometer. So the, the, the calibration was okay. So get hold of a pulse oximeter, get hold of a thermogun or a, or a, or a good thermometer, uh, blood pressure apparatus. So you, you wait uh, for at least uh, maybe as, as much as you can, uh, unless you have a difficulty in breathing. Fever is no issue. Uh, fever is supposed to be there. Uh, myalgia will be there, very severe myalgia and people I have seen, my, my, my family members crying with pain because of myalgia and they, they thought somebody is beating them on, in the, on the muscles and the back. Uh, di diarrhea is very frequent. So you have to do a symptomatic treatment. So, so antipyretic, I will still recommend paracetamol uh, two, uh, three times a day um, for, in, for at least five days. Even if the temperature is 99, do take paracetamol. I said it is not just for antipyretic effect, it is the anti-inflammatory response which NSAIDs have. Um, similarly, I, I use, personally used uh, anti-allergic as well. I used my, uh, my, 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 uh, my tikka uh, for, for some allergic because I have some allergies uh, with different, um, I'm allergic to different dust and different pollens and this is a season as well. So, um, so people can also use some anti-allergics. You can also use uh, uh, some of the uh, sort of uh, drugs which uh, which can help you in uh, in your breathing, like mucol mucolator, uh, the, the the mucus thinning. Uh, you can call them the 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 the, the, the uh, medicine which makes mucus thin, and it is easy to excrete uh, out of your sputum and tough. It makes breathing easy. So at home, you need a good antibiotic, you need Panadol, you need pulse oximeter, you need thermometer, you need blood pressure apparatus, and you need a separate room, or at least a room where no one else should be coming. Uh, make it separate, uh, one bed, and then uh, good food, which is very important. People forget about the food. A small, frequent meals, repeatedly. We did that, and we, we didn't suffer much of the bloating and gastric effects. So small, frequent meals high protein diet, definitely add meat or pulses or beans uh, in, in any of the day, day uh, thing. Take at least two eggs per day, minimum of two eggs. Um, you can have three, two in the morning and one in the evening, but eggs- Thank you, Dr. Shazad. Yeah, this Great. is something. Okay, well, thank you, that, that's helpful. And I know Dr. Aves Masood is also uh, you know, among our panelists okay. uh, who is gonna chime in over here as well. And I'll just make a quick clarification for everybody as well. So um, the acetaminophen, so Panadol is acetaminophen, which is, uh, you know, an antipyretic, uh, but then so many other antipyretics, uh, as Dr. Shazad was alluding to, are anti-inflammatories as well. Those are your NSAIDs. So those would include things like Brufin and yeah, and they have allowed it. They have allowed Brufin now. They say it can be used. I saw that reference. Although they initially they banned, they said Brufin, Brufin I think it was coming from some French uh, researchers that Brufin should not be uh, given. And we made an announcement in Pakistan that uh, no one should take Brufin. But then now they are uh, saying that Brufin, ibuprofen can be taken. Right. So just realize, just like Dr. Shazad, uh, you know, very nicely alluded to, we don't have any, you know, any, um, you know, robust evidence that any of these, you know, works. So yes. the, the cornerstone of management is really, uh, you know, rest, 
uh, take care of your diet, take care of your sleep, take care of your hydration, try to avoid interacting with other people to limit the spread of disease, even as you're at home. Um, and you know things like Panadol can help uh, with the muscle aches, they can help with the fever. And if you're looking for something that uh, you know helps with the pain and fever, but also helps with uh, an anti-inflammatory effect, although it hasn't been proven yet, then you might look for something like ibuprofen, which comes as brufen in Pakistan. And uh, there was some controversy over that earlier on, like Dr. Shazad said, but as of right now, uh, there's no evidence that that uh, hurts us in any way. So Dr. Masood, go right ahead, please. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Masood, I'm in uh, New Jersey here. Uh, just one comment uh, about antibiotics uh, use in COVID. Uh, uh, I mean, our experience is different. If we were in Pakistan, their experience is different. So, uh, but I have seen that uh, in Pakistan, I have been in, and contributing to treatment of uh, many uh, patients there. Actually, all of my uh, friends and their doctors. Uh, I have seen the trend that they are taking very heavy and very prospecting antibiotics and almost all of them has no indication for, to taking antibiotics. I mean, secondary infection is common and it's important to prevent that also. And if they take some antibiotics for that, that's fine. But if you have no indication, should not be taking like three or four, even I've seen antibiotics different at the same time. I can tell you that right now I'm seeing about nine or 10 patients in Pakistan, I mean, uh, talking to them, and none of them have indicated for any broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, and they are taking meropenem, levofloxacin, and some lanzolid also, at the same time. Uh, I have done to check with their procalcitonin level, it's like negative. And they have been prescribed by, who are, I'm talking about in Punjab, not in uh, Northwest uh, area. Uh, so that thing need to avoid. I mean, there are some indication for antibiotics. You can take some like a, a narrow spectrum antibiotics. That is fine if you, there's a, some suspicion, suspicions for any other infection. But I have seen that many complication because of those antibiotics, not from the COVID virus. So just to my comment on that. Thank you. That's uh, extremely helpful. Um, you know, a related question to, uh, and, you know, I, I would second that too, by the way, uh, you know, hearing from so many people who are getting all kinds of antibiotics, which can then increase your risk for clostridium difficile infection, a potentially deadly infection of the GI tract, uh, among other things, it can breed resistance of other organisms and such as well. Um, you know, another question that uh, some of the people have asked is, uh, people are now you know, recognizing the importance of having a pulse oximeter available. And Dr. Shahzad already mentioned that in his talk, uh, that really that, that's sort of the most important reason for somebody to look to go to the hospital is if your oxygen levels are low. Because we know, you know COVID pneumonia uh, affects through hypoxic respiratory failure. It can lead to ARDS and such. And the first thing that you will see if you're really deteriorating in the majority of cases is hypoxia. So people are now recognizing trying to purchase pulse oximeters and such, and many people have it. And a question I frequently get asked as well is, you know, what level of um, oxygen to try to provide supplemental oxygen therapy with at home and or at what level should they look to, um, to go to the hospital? So would any of the panelists like to take that question? Dr. Shazad, would you like to comment on that first? Um, yes, actually, this is something which, um, uh, which is one of the biggest challenges when you have some respiratory problems. Uh, pulse oximeter uh, is is useful in in in. I think this this COVID would be one of the best uh, scenario where uh, the pulse oximeter will help. Otherwise, in many of the other diseases, because I did my clinical in in, in Mayo Hospital in Lahore and in my medical years. And still, in, in when when I was administration administration in, in the administration in the hospital, I saw a lot of typical symptoms which even don't need an investigation. But this disease is so so strange that uh, from inside your lung is absolutely patchy, and uh, there are so many uh, uh, mnemonic patches in your lung, and you do not have much symptoms. Yesterday we met two or three of such kind of of, of patients who were there for some other antenatal checkup or something, and they were asked to go for an ultrasound and 
uh, chest x-ray for cesarean or whatever the routine in anesthesia med, uh, anesthesia clearance takes and they they had uh, big patches in their lungs with without any without any symptom it is very very rare that you have such a high uh, chance of pneumonia or pneumonic patches viral pneumonia in your lung and you don't have that much of uh, uh, of symptoms so pulse oximeter helps when your oxygen saturation or your capacity to uh, get the blood oxygenated is decreasing so we we were told uh, mubeen one of my colleague class fellow and he was he's a trained pulmonologist from us uh, came back to shifa and now is in with another hospital in islamabad he told me that you have to check uh, to keep the figure of 94% so if it is going below 94% Uh, you should rush to the hospital uh, many are saying 85% or 90% but uh, within a, within a few minutes within few maybe one or two hour a person can lose the uh, this uh, oxygen uh, saturation because of the a uh, lot of problems in their lungs and very fast uh, ex- expansion of those patches so this will help a lot it was uh, very uh, highly uh, it, it became very costly but i think new shipment have arrived and it's now available at less price so from to me i will still recommend with in home care uh, not only just uh, to have a pulse oximeter but also there are some concentrators of oxygen and some oxygen cylinder people even have uh, got hold of a disposed disposable or mobile oxygen uh, cylinders for so that in, in case they need it for one or two days they can use it so people are trying a lot of things but i don't think uh, uh, that Uh, when you are needing oxygen or when you you are ha- having severe breathlessness you should not stay at home then they, they, it, it 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 is very essential that you go to emergency right and dr avas you have a uh, raised hand as well please go right ahead you know i agree uh, with dr shudan i mean uh, uh, but obviously they uh, our colleagues in pakistan they know the reality better over there than us here uh, i mean obviously then before they go to hospital uh, they have to be planned thing ahead of time that if things deteriorate which hospital they would go what facility they carry and if they have they, they carry all the facilities they required there obviously them uh, they should plan a bit earlier if they don't have those facilities it's uh, better to stay home as much as they can uh 94 or even lower oxygen level if they can maintain that at home is better but again this all depends on the realities and what the facilities over there are what the facilities available in the hospital is available i am involved in a patient uh, some of them they have lower oxygen saturation than 94 even close to 90 and they were able to stay home uh and they did okay but again uh, it, this condition can deteriorate very quickly and i totally agree with dr shahab he knows the i mean reality is what they better i think i would go for his opinion yeah. and uh, majid there is one more thing which is uh, quite uh, in the news nowadays in pakistan is this plasma uh, plasma replacement it is so much in i can call it like a, like a simple sop everybody who's get, who got an admission uh, for covid in any hospital has started asking the doctors to give plasma and in many cases even the doctors are asking arrange plasma if he become deteriorated so they started by just getting the patient inside the hospital they start looking uh, for the plasma donors who have been and to to tell you very frankly uh, majority of the people who have been uh, treated or we cannot say cured in in a convalescence period after maybe 20 days or 25 days when we got their antibody tested they didn't have any antibody for for corona so very few people who were who who had uh, sort of they got the disease they were covid positive they turned covid negative two negative test and then maybe waiting for another one week they got antibody tested and i think yesterday we tested six of those such people all of them had no antibody my wife she got uh, after she got herself tested the antibody after two weeks of the first symptom and she didn't have any antibody uh, so the, the 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 combo test was supposed to be above one and her was 0.3 so there were some so th- there is a big issue the, the people who are getting uh, treatment uh, they are they, they are actually uh, being treated for plasma but many of the people who have been uh, who have the disease who are now in convalescence period or they have recovered 
not all of them have antibodies so that is another issue uh, and and uh, that 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 is another business which is now booming in the private sector people have started charging money for donation of plasma look at this that you were dying you were having one of the worst disease in the world you god gave you another life and after that you say i will take maybe 1 million or 1.5 million for for my one bottle of plasma and if we get that blood tested for antibody there is no antibody so that is another issue you know it's a it's a very good point that you raised thank you very much dr shahzad and it's a, uh, you know all of these things uh, are when you don't have um, robust evidence in favor of or against any therapy and you're dealing with uh, a disease that is surrounded by a little bit of either actual or perceived novelty then that is a very scary situation because that's that's where evidence based medicine can get thrown out the window so quickly and in fact even within the past 3 months we have seen how uh, you know time after time again people have tried one thing or another uh without evidence out of desperation whereas even if you just uh, you know even if you just look uh at the data the reality is that the majority of people who will uh undergo this infection will uh will self resolve right their bodies will you know will take care of the infection obviously a substantial minority will get really sick but it's very important to pair the patient's clinical condition with need for therapy and an experimental therapy of course comes at the very end of anybody's algorithm uh, plasma based therapy of course is one of them dr shahzad you mentioned how uh, people are really going after uh, you know plasma donors one of the things that comes to my mind as i look at that is uh, simultaneously the concern that uh, as we've seen and you know read in reports and such too and experience personally as physicians so many of these people are at higher risk for a uh, thrombotic event right they can uh, they can develop clots and uh, so clearly uh, these people have a milieu that is uh, more thrombogenic um, you know one of the hypotheses that comes to mind is is it even worthwhile adding more of the same kind of plasma would that lead to potentially an even higher propensity for blood clotting one of the many 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 questions answer one of the many reasons why um lack of evidence based medicine is um so uh, fraught with risk dr avais masood would you like to uh, add to that and then after that dr farhan kadir will thank you i think uh, dr shahzad is a very i think the most important i mean uh, i mean concern at this point uh, having the same thing and i wish that things will get better and people actually will test antibodies uh, before i mean accepting any uh, the plasma the other thing uh, which i like to mention maybe a separate topic but i just mentioned that i have seen uh, many people who are getting uh, i mean access to tocilizumab uh many of them don't need it and some of people who need it they are not able to get it uh there's another big uh, i think a problem in pakistan thank you very much um excellent point there uh, and, uh, don't try uh, to hoard medications uh, Majid, that you don't require yeah uh, majid there is majid there is uh, just one comment uh, i am part of one of one of the study because this is plasma is being given uh for an experimental basis it has never been it has not been proven as a as a treatment of now so um i will not be sharing the results but uh the so far what has the what is the general observation in pakistan is it hasn't saved anybody on ventilator so the people who are running for this plasma most of their patients are on ventilators so if there is a clear cut evidence that <coughs> out of 300 plus plasma donations in this country none of the patient on the ventilator was saved by a plasma uh, i don't think that the, even the doctors should be uh, making people or ma making attendants uh, so much um, uh, co uh, conscious about uh, getting getting hold of a plasma uh, it may work on moderate disease um, i don't know how uh, maybe because there are some antibodies available to fight with the with the disease um, but it it hasn't worked and there are some very specific guidelines even in that experiment there is a very specific inclusion criteria for putting the person putting the patient on plasma and they are very uh, and they are all about mild to moderate case 
So it is not recommended even for the serious cases. So I think this webinar should make people clarify that it is not the end stage uh, like a transplant or like a uh, like a cancer therapy or like something which is which is uh, which has been. I don't see it has been. Yeah, that it has it hasn't it hasn't been proven to be effective in very serious cases. This is to be. Uh, this is, I think, confirmed from all sources. I called almost all the centers and I asked and they say, no, sorry, this is not, uh, not helping in people on vent. So then definitely th there is something else which, which can be done, even if, if it is not that much of, uh, uh, of value, then why to spend so much money for, for nothing? Thank you very much. Excellent yeah, yeah. point. Dr. Farhan Kadir, would you like to add more to this discussion? I see the raised hand. Mr. Valid, if you could unmute him, please. Dr. Farhan Kadir, thank you. Ji, assalamu alaikum. Um, I think uh, I, I had discussion with a lot of my Pakistani colleagues. Um, one thing I recommended them when they were talking to me is to provide good critical care uh, based on my own personal experience, um, I don't think so that this disease is way too off a different, though we all like to try different medication, including plasma, tocilizumab. I think it's very important to provide good critical care in terms of a lot of patients who actually end up staying home. I've been recommending them self-proning, which is harmless in a lot of aspects. And also one thing is that there is no role of antibiotic unless someone is infected. I think it's all about evidence-based practice. Um, based on my understanding regarding convalescent plasma, there is only one good paper, and that also is not peer-reviewed yet. So I don't really want to comment on it, which shows pretty much the same kind of results like, rep, like rep, remdesivir, patients are on oxygen, mild to moderate disease. Um, so my request to my Pakistani colleagues back home and also some of my friends and I talk to is to provide good critical care and uh, hopefully that will save more life than these medications um, which are cheaper and better care. Hopefully that will help. Thank you. Dr. Farhan, thank you very much for uh, you know making that comment. I definitely would echo that, right? I think the, the example that I like to always share uh, with friends and colleagues is the, the fact that um, quality improvement is an actual science in the best of centers. And what is quality improvement? It is simply uh, efforts to translate known, uh, known to be proven therapies uh, into actual bedside practice. Even in the best of centers across the world, uh, we human beings struggle to implement findings from robust uh, you know, evidence, robust scientific studies. And uh, the, basic, you know, the, the name of the game is really good critical care, uh, just like Dr. Farhan Kadir said there. Um, the reality is that the majority of patients will be able to ride out this infection. They will get sick and then they will get better. Some of them will get sick enough to the point that their oxygen levels might become life-threatening for a certain period of time. For those people, we provide them with oxygen and let their body get more time to do the same as it does in the majority of cases. And for even smaller numbers of patients, they, their respiratory failure will get so severe that they will actually require uh, you know, ventilator management. And when you get to that point where you're trying to assist somebody with their breathing, we know from good evidence accumulated over the past several decades that ventilators can cause as much harm as they can provide benefit. And so the name of the game then becomes uh, what we call lung protective ventilation, what we refer to as keeping the patients dry, not overloading them with drips and infusions of IV fluids, with giving them a chance to get off of the ventilator every day whenever clinically feasible, and so on. Um, so those are all, uh, you know, the basics of good critical care. And, you know, the, the reality is that critical care is a tool that we have in the 21st century to let bodies get more time to recover. Other than that, 
we're basically not doing much of anything at this point in time, like Dr. Shazad and others mentioned as well. We currently don't have a uh, robustly proven therapy that's going to alter the course of the disease in any patient. Um, perhaps, perhaps remdesivir may have some data that favors its use, but it's not widely available, not yet, not even in the United States right now. So short of that, um, monitor your oxygen levels, try to do whatever you can at home to keep them up. And like Dr. Farhan Kadir mentioned too, you know, self-proning, awake proning is, uh, you know, is something that you could use. Just try to uh, lie down with your belly to the bed. Um, I, I pasted a link to a, a website uh, conveniently called uh, covidprotocols.org. Yeah. I pasted it in the chat forum. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, I, I know of it because I've been involved in, um, in constantly rehashing it. This is, a, uh, this is a document that at my institution, the attendings and the fellows from different specialties have put together. And every week we meet twice a week to examine more and more evidence as it comes in and add to this, uh, you know, this living document. So don't print it out, but refer to it every day or every week and uh, you know, see where the evidence is at present, but the name of the game is really good critical care. Um, I do want to ask uh, our panelists a couple more questions. Um, people have talked about, uh, you know, sort of, and this is a topic that comes up frequently is, uh, you know, about in gaining immunity and such, right? Um, so what does the panel think, uh, you know, we understand at present as far as, um, are we going to become immune after we have recovered? And a related question to that is, um, if, a, if a doctor or another healthcare provider becomes uh, COVID positive, how long should they take before they return to work? Dr. Shadad, would you like to take that? Yeah, uh, there is, um, there is in, in Pakistan, we had an SOP initially uh, for, for say two weeks. Then we revise it, and now in part, what we are, what we are doing is when, when you have COVID um, and you have passed ten days after being tested positive or the start of the symptom, and you are free for at least three days of, from the symptoms like fever, cough, and uh, breathlessness and myalgia. If you are free for three days, and if you have have you have completed seven days, so almost around ten days, people get better and they are they can they can break their isolation. Initially, there was a compulsion of getting two PCR tests negatives, but I think that, uh, now it's not uh, not being practiced. So if you are uh, you passed ten days, you are three days free from symptoms, and um, uh, you you had a positive test around 10, 10 days ago, you can go and you don't need a testing. Immunity. If you talk about immunity for the last one month, I have been following with a lot of my UK friends as well. They send me a link today. Even in the UK, the, the persons uh, having Im immunity after getting COVID is not more than 20%. So uh, that is a very strange thing. So immune response, uh, maybe it's a good thing. For example, I, I, I didn't have any antibody in myself for the last maybe two weeks I am suffering. Um, the, the Davinda didn't get any uh, antibody. Maybe it was not a, a, a good, robust immune response which saved us or had less uh, symptoms. Maybe a very high level response by the body against the virus makes persons more symptomatic. I don't know. This is all uh, being researched. Uh, the, the more symptoms you have, and I have found one of my students who was in Multan, uh, he sent me a report of a very high quality lab, Aga Khan, and, and um, he had a very high level of antibodies in his blood where he didn't get even the disease. His family members were positive. He was working in a hospital with the COVID patients. He never got the disease, tested, repeatedly tested negative, and antibody level was around six point something. Where it was needed was only above one. So this, this is something which is quite, quite uh, common in Pakistan. We, there's no, nothing is sure about it. But uh, uh, the, the only worry which comes when we say the immunity uh, in the persons is less and uh, we should have good diet and we should do exercise, uh, mental health sort of um, ex exercises like breathing exercises and positive thinking, uh, physical activity also promotes mental health. So all of these we recommend. Uh, but the immunity thing that worries me is, is that we can have 
maybe it 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 can come back again but then again it's like flu it it doesn't come uh, in, in the same month it may be coming after a few few months so uh, that is one issue i have uh, with us i think i have seen professor rizwan taj uh, i would request him to show some uh, light on or to show to to advise the some of the people on how to improve their mental health specifically in this time of severe terror and um, a lot of threatening uh, situation in the country uh, majid over to you excellent idea dr rizwan taj are you with us i, I don't see him here though maybe he's uh, part of the attendees mr walid can you check i saw him in the i, can, uh, I think he is left now okay great uh, maybe maybe yeah okay. team can can contribute to that yeah anyone anyone on mental health please wakar are you there kindly might be good to get to professor iqbal afridi he's the president yeah. of psychiatric society yeah yeah sure if we can give the mic to professor iqbal afridi mr bari if you could unmute him please thank you professor afridi go ahead uh you're muted right now Yeah, he's muted. Uh, muted. Hello. Please go right ahead, please. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Can't hear. Yeah, Professor, Professor Iqbal. Fridi, uh, go right ahead, Professor Iqbal. Fridi, we can hear you. If uh, if you could call. Uh, Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm really grateful to uh, all of you, uh, especially the participants and uh, those who has, are contributing to the academic uh, of Pakistan. And uh, I'm very thankful to all of them. And this is their great contribution because uh, nowadays the pandemic of COVID has reached everywhere, and we want that there should be uh, some co coordination, collaboration, so that. uh we can uh, have the, that treatment which is really uh, evidence based and uh, there are many many rumors and other things which we face and misconception and myths uh, in pakistan so therefore our colleagues who are working uh, in the established department are abroad so their valuable opinion will definitely give us chance to Uh, make our uh, treatment line and uh, preventive or other measure according to the international standard thank you very much thank you very much for the excellent uh, your comments uh, professor iqbal afridi we are at the top of the hour and we have covered a lot of items but i do want to get uh, you know a couple of things more additionally done one i want to take one more uh, you know subject matter then i'll uh, i'll let any other panelist comment if they feel like they wanted to comment something on any aspect of today's discussion or anything else and then if we have time we will take one live question as well um so the the subject to be discussed here is the role of thromboprophylaxis uh, in covid or anti thrombotic management people have asked about that um would anyone like to comment on that dr shahzad would you like to start uh in pakistan they are recommending they are uh, almost every person who is tested positive is started with loprin or the dispirin cv or there is another uh, oral tablet by the name of accept or something like this uh, there, there is there is a trend of giving um, the platelet sort of a disaggregation the disaggregate uh, drugs uh, this is uh, not been proven uh, by any study so far in pakistan that it has effect or not but given the italian auto autopsy data mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, thrombotic and thrombolytic and other uh, presentations in 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 a global uh, scenario people have started uh, giving these medications but i'm not sure whether they helped or not so i will uh, you know piggy back on that as well and i will say you know um, at my institution in boston as well we do use it uh because of the you know the data that we have seen uh associating covid with increased risk of blood clots uh somebody asked about a uh, clexane in particular which is enoxaparin and it is one of the uh one of our favorite drugs to be used 
uh, we do try to pair it with sort of the severity of illness as uh, indicated by where the patient is currently situated. If they're in the, you know, on the hospital floor, we usually give prophylactic doses. So for example, you know, enoxaparin once a day. Uh, and if they are in the ICU, we try to do it a little bit more. Uh, we've all seen strokes. We've seen arterial lines get thrombosed. Of course, we've seen DVTs and PEs as well. Um, the data is still fluid. Uh, like Dr. Shazad said, it needs to be emphasized. But, uh, you know, so we have tried to, at our institution, as in many other places, tried to do, um, you know, as honest of a job as we can with uh, using them. I would, again, draw your attention to, you know, doing these kinds of things in a protocolized manner. One of the many options available to everyone would be just go to covidprotocols.org and look at the section on hematology uh, to help you figure out, you know, whether to use it and if so, what doses and what specific indications. Uh, that Majid, is by no means yeah. the... Involved. Majid, uh, in Pakistan, what they are doing is they are getting the D-dimer uh, done, uh, C-reactive protein and ferritin. These three levels, uh, they, they get it done. If they are above 1,000, uh, they start flexing. So the, yes, the heparin uh, substitutes, they are also being used in the admitted cases. Uh, I was referring to the, the home-based uh, cases in Pakistan. They are being advised Disprin, CV or uh, Loprin or any other um, different kind of um, blood thinning. Um, otherwise, Plexin is being done, being, being given in Pakistan also in ICUs uh, in cases where the D-dimer and uh, ferritin and C-reactive protein, these, these are higher. Gee, Bilkul. And, you know, here in the U.S. too, there's such variation. Uh, you know, many centers are using those kinds of pro-inflammatory markers and, and, and D-dimers uh, as yeah. well, um, and others aren't. It's really, uh, you know, because the evidence is sort of still fluid, yeah. we're all trying, we're struggling. Dr. Aves Masood has a comment to make in this regard as well. Please go right ahead. So, as my experience, so while uh, not treating, I would say, I uh, contributing to their care in uh, some patient in Pakistan. So basically, patient who is not patient, a uh, person who is asymptomatic, uh, doesn't need anything, not even aspirin. Uh, but again, a patient who are sick or symptomatic, uh, we in our hospital also, hospitalized patient, their dose of uh, uh, levofloxacin, sorry, not levofloxacin, uh, lovinox, it depends upon their D-dimer, uh, their marker level. So if it's very high, they need a higher dose and they're like less than they just need like 40 milligram daily. If they're like in about range of 2000, they need 40 twice a day. And if it's more than that, they need a full uh, therapeutic dose. Excellent, thank you. So if any other uh, you know, member of the panel would like to add anything, and if you are going to, I would also invite you to see if you can cover this final question on uh, you know, what face masks should health professionals use? Uh, would anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet like to add anything to today's discussion? Uh, Majid, this is Dr. Nahid Usmani. Can I add a few comments? Please go right ahead, Dr. Usmani. Okay. Okay. So first of all, all healthcare professional and everybody should have a simple surgical mask that they wear at all times while in the hospital. That is the policy that is implemented across United States and Europe. I don't think you need KN95 or N95 masks other than when you are in direct uh, uh, proximity of a COVID-19 patient that you're taking care of. Other than that, you should, a simple surgical mask is all that is required 24 seven. Secondly, my recommendation to people in Pakistan, uh, to physicians in Pakistan, is to develop national standards. This is a new disease. Nobody knows what the right thing to do is, but if you develop national standards, classify the disease as mild, moderate, severe, and what to do in each of those categories, which is standardized across, then you will be successful and you will have clear data. Uh, like Majid was explaining, that they are updating the COVID uh, protocols on a weekly to daily basis, you will be able to amend based on real time data and 
it will be, uh, you know, clinically sound and scientifically verified. It, but it all depends whether there is any data gathering on these patients. I found this whole discussion extremely useful. Thank you, Dr. Shazad, both for sharing your personal experiences and the clinical yeah. experiences. Yeah. So that's what I would like to add in on my behalf. Thank you. Thank, Thank you Dr. very much for adding, uh, you know, those insightful comments, uh, Dr. Osmani. Excellent. Uh, you know, if uh, thank you to attendees and the panelists for continuing to stick around. I know we are a little bit over time. Um, I will, uh, you know, take one live question as well. And of course, anybody who needs to uh, jump off is, is welcome to. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Hamama Bushra uh, to see if, uh, if she could uh, ask her question if it hasn't been answered yet. Go ahead. You are currently muted. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm a Professor Umar from Rawalpindi Medical University. So thank you very much. Assalamualaikum, uh, uh, Umar Sahab. Kya hai? Theek hai? Dr. Shazad. Thank you for joining. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I've been listening for a long time and I was listening and I think that was a wonderful okay. discussion. Uh, uh, you know, situation in Pakistan, mein, we are the second in Punjab and possibly fifth in the whole country. And the Rawalpindi is the, I think, uh, second epicenter in Punjab. Yeah. Uh, we have about 2,000 positive cases uh, and have about 220 mortality, which is, I think, 2.2%. Uh, yeah. And we have about 10% uh, critical cases. If I just quote uh, today, uh, we have 400, uh, I think, 10 cases out, out of them. 240 are on oxygen. Out of this, hundreds are on 10 liter oxygen, and uh, there are about uh, 30 on ventilators. So, this is a huge burden. Well, just precisely, mm -hmm. uh, I think we have three issues. Our challenge is with the healthcare delivery system how to reduce the burden. So, this is the major question. As everybody is saying, that the number is going to increase, burden is going to increase, and we all understand our health system is very weak. So uh, how to reduce? So this is the challenge to the government and the healthcare worker and to the general population. And that we all know is because uh, that's only possible with the prevention and intervention. Second is the, uh, uh, how to do the capacity building. So possibly I would like to know the experience uh, of, uh, you know, uh, globally that how they dealt with this. And particularly in our setup, which is the, uh, we have less beds, we have less ICU beds, less uh, high dependency beds, and less human resources, and more, uh, you know, infection in the healthcare work, reducing the, uh, the, the uh, workforce. This is the second issue. And third, obviously, uh, people do not believe in evidence-based medicine, or rational use of medicine. At the same mm -hmm. time, so attendants are very worried of the outcomes. Yeah. And uh, many physicians, uh, uh, you know, even from our center, they use the drug like, uh, you know, plasimab, uh, plasma, convalescent plasma, remedicers, uh, even metacines, and, uh, you know, and they're not used in proper doses. I do understand what Avas was saying. So I think these are the three major challenges for us. So I think I would like to have your short comment and guidance that how to face this challenge in this uh, particular scenario. Thank you very much uh, for asking me for my question. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Majid, may I answer? Ji, bilkul. Absolutely. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think this is the very pertinent points, all very uh, sort of relevant things mentioned by Professor Umar, and he's in the field. He's fighting at the forefront of uh, Rawalpindi region. Uh, all the big districts surrounding Rawalpindi are also coming to Rawalpindi for uh, COVID management. And Rawalpindi Institute is also one of the institutes uh, who is working on, who is part of the experimental studies. He didn't mention it, but I know uh, that they are part of the big plasma uh, study also. So they are part of a lot of other clinical trials. They are doing a lot of research. They are doing a lot of capacity building training. Uh, prevention and uh, prevention and control of the, the internationally known phenomenon, internationally known practice is um, lockdown. WHO already advised intermittent lockdown for Pakistan. I think we have to go for uh, some, some, some of this uh, 
practice specifically in those areas which are hot spots uh, and in islamabad they did that they, they closed some of the sectors uh, where there were a lot of cases coming coming so in pakistan i i think the first and the most important uh, understanding which the government and the policy makers should do is understanding that the we cannot bear the burden like professor umar already mentioned they are, they are already doing over their capacity so we cannot wait for another few weeks to get people on the on the streets it, it, there will be fights and there will be riots over here uh, on, on beds so uh, the, the first thing we should be doing is uh, you may call it smart lockdown but please you have to go for a lockdown in the cases in areas where there are more cases in this digital world everybody knows the, through the cell number that which areas have and we have apps we have a lot of apps showing Uh, people who have tested positive their cell numbers are with the government with natra so it's it's not difficult to map the areas with high load and and and, and make them maybe 10 days or 15 days lockdown over there it will definitely uh, help capacity building professor umar mentioned uh, i will share uh, one of the link it is on the website of health services academy uh, we have started uh, with cpsp with who and with chinese university of hong kong we have started intensive care management first level uh, high level intensive care management training ppe uh, use and uh, disposal and uh, donning coughing and uh, different kind of ventilator use uh, trainings online it is 3 days online and then one day in uh, in the hospital it is free it is it, it gives a certification by cpsp plus who plus chinese university plus hsa so it's a very high much value added training i would request everybody to to go at healthservicesacademy.edu.pk um just put the, the see over there covid basic trainings and you will find the link register yourself and our or uh, volunteer will definitely reach to you and register you and give you online training there are some softwares there through which you can use uh, different types of uh, ventilators uh, icu settings there are a lot of uh, course material available to you there will be reading material given to you free of cost so uh, training and capacity building i don't see uh, there is a big issue uh, in fact there is another there is another side people are worried uh, professor umar is right in uh, getting their doctors trained but on the other side the doctors working in riu or rmc or holy family or bdhq uh, they are worried that if they are they got training in icu they will spend the rest of their year in in icu so they are reluctant to get the training that is one of our big problem for us so if if dr umar can convince their young doctors uh, the the newcomers who who should be trained and they would become the forerunner and front runner of a uh, uh, sort of an intensive care management you don't have that much icus but a trained person would be very much beneficial even in the wards you can you can turn the ward into into good uh, critical care i think uh, the, from the day, from the first first sentence majid and and shahid and all everybody is talking about zahid is talking about uh, this uh, intensive care or good critical care it doesn't necessarily be to be state of art icu it has to be a very very well trained hr uh, and the medication of course so the second is capacity building we will be helping and i'll 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 make sure because i am the focal person for those trainings you can directly contact me uh, we have a huge number of uh, seats for that uh, we have one of the top critical specialist in pakistan like professor janal aslam professor shahab nakvi uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, the professor taki from lahore uh, and there are nadiha hashmi from karachi so they, we are working with the senior people in pakistan and they are willing to work uh, with us to impart these training so this third one second one is training and that one is of course when the media and mass media and and making people aware of um, how to behave and how to and people have started i think now i see a change because of a lot of uh, political people as well as uh, business, as well as famous celebrities and personalities getting covid unfortunately uh, now people have started believing what the doctors were saying around 3 months ago thank you thank Maji. you so much thank you very much um, so real quick uh, dr uh, vakar azim and then dr avais masood and then we'll end so uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity this is vakar azim just two quick comments uh, as uh, most of the people know in pakistan i'm a psychiatrist and involved in a lot of things in pakistan just two quick things i think uh, it's extremely important how we take care of our frontline staff mentally and physically if they're in good morale we will produce good results if we have demoralized workforce no matter whatever we put together it's not going to work 
And second comment is that uh, a lot of uh, questions were asked about anxiety and depression and mental health. We are doing a series of webinars on this particular topic. So there will be a next one on this topic for 90 minutes on June 28th. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And Dr. Masood, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, so I'm an intensivist and also an nephrologist. Here in uh, over the last year, almost three months, we have seen that there are so many renal issues in ICU patients also. And the way we started it during uh, hemodialysis on those patients, initially we did a lot of mistakes and then we learned and then we actually changed our uh, doing how to dialyze the patient in ICU and other renal stuff. So then we shared our knowledge with other uh, institutes in US and they actually adapted it. So my question from Dr. Shizad and Dr. Omar is that uh, if we can contribute to our experience uh, with the nephrologist in your institute or area, please let me know. Uh, there are some many critical and very different issue other than regular take care of uh, dialysis patient or renal patient in ICU. I'll be more than happy to share with them. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Masood. And if you want, you could also share uh, your email address for Dr. Shahzad uh, through the personal, the private uh, sort of chat link as well. Great. And Dr. Uh, Vakarazim, did you have any other comment? Uh, I see the raised hand. Perhaps it was uh, by mistake. Um, well, thank you very much to everybody for a lively and a very fruitful uh, webinar. It was wonderful learning from everyone and hearing from everyone. Special thanks to Dr. Shahzad uh, for sharing your perspectives and experiences and helping uh, so many of the questions uh, you know, get answered. Uh, please stay safe, everybody, and thank you for all that you do in uh, taking care of uh, humanity. Uh, this too shall pass, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, man.